as we have a chance to get it up this there. This meeting is being recorded. Welcome everybody to the August uh, episode in our series of free online presentations for Border Historical Society. And tonight's guest is Dr. Kim Seabold of University of Maine at Presque Isle. And she's going to be discussing a, a fantabulous cemetery project that she has done. And it, it was a big hit when she did a presentation for Maine Genealogical Society. Um, she's been, uh, she's worked for 22 years at the University of um, Maine at Presque Isle and taught online methodology classes on local history. Her passion for local history started in her master's program at the University of Delaware, where she researched the development of the chicken industry on the Delmarva Peninsula, where she grew up. And as boring as that sounds, a black market in chickens became the center of the story. She continued researching and writing local history while working for the Historic American Building Survey on a project about salt marsh farming in Southern Jersey. The salt marshes and local history led to a PhD at the University of Maine at Orono and then on to a job at the University of Maine at Presque Isle. Welcome, Kim, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll just start by saying that this project uh, turned into a monster. And <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I, I'm trying to, uh, to wield it and uh, get it under control. I, I was supposed to have a sabbatical in 2020 and that didn't happen because of COVID. Um, and so um, it, was, it was supposed to be a local history um, uh, project and, and it didn't go anywhere because I couldn't get into the school system. So instead I thought, oh, well, I'll start mapping cemeteries and do the history of, of this area of a rustic county uh, through the people in the cemeteries. And so that's how this whole thing got started. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first give you a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation, and then I'm gonna introduce you to my website and, um, and let you see how things are developing. I wish that there were more things on the website at this point. Uh, there's lots of things in the background that, that need to be put up. Um, but they're still getting tweaked and um, and and we're still doing field work. So I guess I'll just share my screen here and ask if everybody can see that. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation? Is that a yes? Yes, okay. All right, um, let's see. And I'm just gonna do it this way as opposed to try to start it. So anyway, I just wanted to, um, start by talking about the things that have become near and dear to my heart um, for uh, being in the cemetery. So this is my third summer in the cemetery. The first summer I had one volunteer. Uh, the second summer I, uh, I had money to hire people. Um, and this summer I had even more money since I received a, a Stephen and Tabitha King grant. Um, and the Stephen and Tabitha King grant also um, helped with some other things that I'll talk about when I get to the website. So for me, these are my, uh, my five most important things uh, for being in a cemetery. Um, and that's D2. And if you've been to the Maine Old Cemetery Association um, meetings or whatever, I'm sure you've heard of D2. Um, it's the best thing for stones and it is amazing what it will do to a stone. I'll show you that um, in a little while. And then uh, plastic bristle brushes because they don't scratch the stones. And I usually get mine from the dollar store. Um, and I'm sure the lady always looks at me like, why do you have 40 brushes? And I'm, you know, we go through them quite, quite regularly. Uh, linoleum cutters are really great for cutting sod. Um, so if you need to do any edging around your house, um, 
I would, or any edging around a cemetery stone, I would recommend um, a linoleum cutter. There are some other tools out there, gardening tools um, that you could use, um, but my crew seems to like the linoleum cutters the best. And then the plastic putty knife we use to scrape the lichens and the mold or in the mildew and the moss off the stones. And then we uh, use the water sprayer. Uh, we fill it with water and it gives us enough pressure to clean off the stones. Um, so this is my, this is my toolkit uh, along with some buckets um, and some spray bottles for the D2 because um, obviously you can't use it out of that. You need to spray it on. Um, and my car is filled with all of this stuff. Um, three other items that I have found important um, is a Garmin Montana 680T, um, and they run about $600, um, but they give you a much better um, latitude and longitude than, say, the $150 Garmin's. Um, there's always a margin of error. Um, if you wanted a a machine that didn't give you a margin of error, it would cost 10 grand. Um, and that's not something that I had enough money for. So we use these garments. Um, aluminum foil and uh, denture brushes are also um, important and can be bought at the dollar store um, as well. So I wanna kind of go through and show you some pictures of our project from this year. Um, this year we did a 17 acre cemetery in Caribou called Evergreen Cemetery. It was our largest cemetery to date. We started on uh, May the 9th and we ended on August the 10th. And uh, we did have a couple of rain days, um, but we worked seven days a week. So, I mean, we did get, you know, we probably lost about a week, maybe a week and a half due to rain or bad weather. Um, but for the most part, we were we were out there every day um, working between four and five hours a day. Um, and so I estimate there was probably close to 6,000 stones in that graveyard um, since it was about 17 acres. Um, so kind of give you an idea. And I had a team of, um, I have a crew of seven at the height of my crew. So, um, so <clears throat> this is, these are kinds of things that um, you wanna look for when you start, um, when you start to work in a cemetery. Um, what happens, and the science in a cemetery is absolutely amazing to me. Um, when mowers mow over flat stones and they leave the remains of the grass on the flat stones, that actually breaks down and creates soil, which then leads to more grass growth. And then in the process, a flat stone can also sink um, due to settling and, and other environmental issues. And stones become obscured, they disappear, um, and this is what you will find. So my workers actually walked over this stone, although I will tell you that I do have workers that find these. Um, and then they save them for me because these are my favorite stones to work at, on. So that linoleum cutter uh, would have been the first thing that I would have used to cut back this stone. And as you can see, this is the end result. Um, and, and it has D2 on it which is why it's a little bit orange and why you see some studs in there um, because otherwise you wouldn't really be able to see what was written on there because it was, it was really um, uh, worn, worn down. Um, it says Hattie and Mary and they were children um, they, that uh, died in the 1860s. And it, I think it says there that they're six months old. Um, so who knows how long that stone had been covered up, um, but much longer and it probably would have totally disappeared. So, so I urge you when you're walking through a cemetery to always watch where you're walking 
So A, you don't trip and B, you don't stub your toe and C, you don't miss stones like this one. Um, and then I'm gonna show you this. This is another um, stone. This one wasn't completely obscured. You could see this bottom end of it, um, but you can see how, well, he's got a linoleum cutter right there and you can see how the sod has created itself over the stone um, by him lifting up like that. Uh, and in this picture, you can kind of see how deep uh, the the stone was, how much sod had covered it over. Um, this is before you know we wiped it all off and everything. And then this is the actual, the final project. And I don't know if that's a misspelling of Jacob's or if that is really a real last name. Um, because there were a lot of Jacobs in the cemetery, which is what made me wonder whether or not it was a misspelling. Um, but I would think if it was misspelled that horribly, they would have asked for um, a redo. Although I have seen stones where they've made a mistake and then they go back over and chisel back over the mistake to try and correct it. So, you know, who knows? Um, so I just wanted to show you this to give you a sense of, of how, how deeply buried these stones can get. So when we go in there, this is, this is what we're looking for. This is why we need that wire cutter. Um, this is why we need, or the linoleum cutter. This is why we use the brushes um, and the D2. The D2 clear, clean that up. And, and um, if I went back today, it probably would be a little bit brighter. However, I will tell you that if you want the stone to stay bright, you probably need to spray it with D2 every year. Um, and if you want it to not get uh, covered back up, you probably need to go back every year and cut it out again, because I was amazed at how fast the stones that we had unearthed in May were already starting to get grass covered again on them by uh, July. So, and that was just because, again, the mowers were, were mowing on it. Um, so the, this stone here is the reason for the aluminum foil. Um, this one was also covered pretty well and we dug it out. As you can see, it had already fallen over. Um, and so it's kind of, it's a little bit hard to read. Um, and so what we do, instead of doing grave rubbings or anything that will leave a mark on the stone, uh, we spray the stone with water and then we put aluminum foil over it. And then we take those uh, denture brushes and gently rub over the stone in order for it to pop out. So we could read that it was, this is Frankie E. And he is the son of Rolano and um, Hattie Lawrence. And he died in August of August 27th of 1890. Um, and this is this is a really good way to uh, get epitaphs. Um, you can't always get all of the epitaphs, but you can get quite a few of the epitaphs that you can't read um, just by the naked eye. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to show you that too. Um, and this is more of a photo of just showing you what the D2 did. So this is what that stone looked like in the beginning. I mean, it was it was completely black. She sprayed it with water. She scraped it and she was scraping it pretty well um, with that uh, plastic putty knife. And then she um, sprayed it with D2 and let it sit. I mean, if you look at the bottle, it says let it to let it sit for five to ten minutes, or you can just let it sit and walk away from it. Uh, we we let it sit for a couple of minutes, then we spray the water on it, and then we scrub it down. Um, as you can see, she's got a scrub brush right here, um, and now she's spraying it down. And then this is this is the uh, the result, and. I picked this particular stone to show you because this woman was the president of the Aroostook County uh, chapter of the WCTU, uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, so 
this this was also important there was another woman close near close by her and she was also part of the wctu um and so this kind of gave me the idea that i think i should look more into the newspapers about the wctu in caribou and and see exactly what those women were doing um and if their name if their names show up in the newspapers and maybe write something about them so um so that was one of the things um the other thing about this cemetery which was really very very sad um so caribou i don't know if you if you know anything about caribou but luring air force base is connected to caribou and there there was housing for the base um, on the caribou side of the base. So there's like a caribou side and limestone side of the base. So there were people who lived in caribou who were connected to the base. So I found, uh, I found the 1960 babies first and they were um, behind the caretakers buildings. And there was probably about a dozen or so babies and this is all you would find is this little, um, sim uh, this is a funeral home plaque. Uh, the, what, the 1960s babies were not as well preserved as the 1950s babies. But the problem was that these things really did get buried because not only of the mowing, but just because of the fact that there are these temporary plaques. My idea, and I, I have not proven this yet, and I could be completely wrong, but my idea is that these are babies that were born to people from Loring and knew that they wouldn't be staying around. So they didn't buy, um, they didn't buy uh, good stones. I mean, there were some local names but there were a lot of names there that are not local. So my idea is that, and, and the only way I'm going to find that out is if I go and look for their death certificates and see what, what they have to say. And I just haven't had time to do this. So we had to actually, so this is a whole hill in that cemetery, uh, that 17 acre cemetery. And the hill is nothing but these, um, these little plaques. A lot of them, as you can see, were put onto um, some kind of uh, uh, concrete block um, and laid in there, which is why I think they were better preserved than the 1960s babies. Um, because the 1960s babies, these letters come out. And so some of them, the names had disappeared. Um, and, and, and while the cemetery does have names of some of the babies they don't have names of all of the babies uh, i got a list of of their names um so you can see here they're 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 cleaning out um or cleaning off these um these grave sites uh i actually also took a, a metal detector here and found more since these are metal um metal plaques um, they would pick up um, from with the metal detector. So you can kind of see all, this is part of the crew um, cleaning cleaning these. I think this touched me the most just because they were babies. And I think also because the 60s babies are would be my age if they were alive. And so it just kind of resonated with me a little bit. Um, the other thing that we found in this big cemetery, and I had, hadn't had seen this before in the cemeteries that um, we've done about 35 or 36 cemeteries in, uh, in the central rustic area. Um, so, but I hadn't seen uh, stones that looked like this before where it actually said where they were killed in action um, in World War II. Um, and so this, this guy here was killed at Iwo Jima. Uh, this guy was killed in Germany. Um, I think this guy was killed in, uh, I looked him up. I think he was killed in, in, um, in France. You've got two people here that were killed in, um, in, uh, Africa. This guy was killed in Sicily. Um, this guy was killed in France. There was another man who was killed in England um, in a car accident. 
uh, but he had a similar stone. Um, and I guess I wasn't aware that uh, these types of stones actually existed. I think they are military stones. I'm not, um, and I, I think they're special stones because they're kind of all shaped the same. Um, and I think they're, they're, um, they were probably specialized stones for, for this time period. I did start doing some research on these men. Um, this guy, especially, his name is uh, Donald Bishop McNeil. And um, I found a lot of yearbook stuff about him in Ancestry, which kind of, I thought was very interesting um, just to see that, you know, he'd gone to high school and that he was pretty, he was pretty, prominent in in the school um the other thing that i found and i don't know if you guys know this or not um their bodies didn't come back for uh until like the till like 47 48 and 49 which i guess i didn't realize that i i just immediately thought that their bodies were sent home and um and buried but the newspapers will tell you that there's memorial service. Well, the newspapers will tell you that uh, they they were they were killed, and then they'll tell you that there's memorial services, and then you'll find a couple of years later where the bodies have finally been sent back, and they have internment services. So I thought that that was quite interesting. Um, I mean, I I knew that they did that for Civil War. Well, I don't think that the Civil War veterans are actually buried. I think there, a lot of them are buried in national cemeteries in the South, but um, you know that made sense to me. But I guess I thought by '44, by World War II, they would be sending them home. But evidently, they buried them um, somewhere where they died, and then they then they disinterred them and sent them home. Um, so I'm going to be doing a lot more research on this too, just like I am on those babies and the WCTU, um, because I think this is an interesting story to tell um, about the men who served in World War II. I mean, all veteran stories are interesting, but um, I, I just, you know, the killed in action, it just, I don't know, these, these again resonated with me. Um, in all of the cemeteries that we've done, we've always found homemade stones. Um, this actually is not my favorite homemade stone, but this is one from um, Evergreen Cemetery. And this stone has been, this cross has been there at least since 1965. Um, and what's interesting about this, I don't know if you can read this by this picture, but her name is Julia Alexander. And it says, not born, but on earth, December 19th, 1889, in heaven, August 15th, 1965. I had never heard born and death in that, that way before. And I thought that was really quite, quite interesting. So, um, so I just wanted to share, to share that with you. Um, and, um, I, I don't know why I again the homemade stones kind of speak to me just as much as the beautiful ornate stones do. Um, so with that, I will take you to my website and um, I'm sure that um, I can put this in the chat box as well. Um, so that you guys can have the address to it if you want it. Um, so let me do that right now while I'm thinking about it. Um, that was my thought too about the uh, junior airmen as well, that they couldn't afford it. Um, so anyway, so, um, all right. So this is my, um, this is my website um, called Histories in Stone. Um, this is possible made been made possible in part by the Maine Humanities Council and by um, a Zillman professorship. I, I'm told that I always have to sneak in that who who's made these things possible. Um, and I guess I'll show you the story maps. I I um I have about um 
like I said, we've done about 35 story. We've done about 35 cemeteries. Uh, the Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation allowed me not only to hire people to work in cemeteries this summer, but also to hire someone to input all the information into the cemeteries. So, so what I will tell you is that after we have cleaned up all of those stones, uh, we take that Garmin and we sit it on the stone and we get an average waypoint, which is the average latitude and longitude. It means that it pulls from multiple um, satellites, um, which is why it's an average. Um, and, <clears throat> and then while that's happening, my workers, um, I, oh, I have my background blurred, don't I? Um, can I fix that from here? Uh, okay. So my workers, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's just a sheet of paper and and they've written everything down that's on the stone. Yes, I know this guy's handwriting is not the best, but he you get to read it after a while. You 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 understand his writing. Um and so what happens is after we take the waypoint, we get all this information written down, we take photographs then somebody has to input all this information into an Excel spreadsheet um, with those latitude and longitude points. And then those spreadsheets become the background to these cemetery maps. Um, so I will show you um, a couple of these cemetery maps. And there is a, um, like I said, there is a margin of error because like, this one really isn't in the trees. It's just really close to the trees. Um, so if you click on the dot, um, you'll see the latitude and the longitude, the name. Um, if there's a birth date, you'll have the birth date. If not, you have the death date and then the age and then the, um, the epitaph and whatever else was put on the stone. So this, this cemetery, um, uh, these were early settlers of um, Washburn, Maine, uh, which is a little town just to the uh, west, uh, the northwest of Presque Isle. And um, these, the, evidently a diphtheria and a scarlet fever epidemic went through there early on. And these people uh, died as a result of that. So, um, so, so we put all the information that we can get off those stones. And then if you click on the, um, if you click on that more information, there is, um, there is the information. Um, and then if you look back here, it said one of two. So if you click on number two, then the other person who was on that stone will pop up. And, um, and and you'll have the information for that. And again, it, it'll show you the same stone. Um, Kim, are we supposed to be looking at your website right now? I'm, I'm only seeing the address. Oh, you can't see the, oh, hold on. Let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you. All right. Now, can you see it? Can you see cemetery maps? Yes. Okay, so now I'll go back to view the Munson Christie Cemetery. Um, so this isn't the home page. This is what the home page looks like. Um, and it it gives you the story uh, this tells you about the story maps, the cemetery maps. And I will eventually have stuff on individual towns down here as well. Um, that's being done right now. So the cemetery map, so like I said, Everything behind these maps is an Excel spreadsheet. So now, can you see the map? Yes. yes. You can, okay. All right. So this is, I think I clicked on this guy. Uh, nope, I clicked, did I click on him? Uh, well, anyway, we'll, we'll use Lucinda as an example instead of the other person I had. Um, like I said, we try to get everything that's on the stone and we had to get we had to use the foil method in order to get the epitaph if the stone is fragile if the stone has cracks if the stone um is very loose 
um, we don't push on the stone. So we will walk, we, we walk away from it and lose the epitaph, I guess is what I'm saying. So I just want you to know that we don't uh, cause more problems by trying to get the epitaph. And then this is the picture. Can you see the picture? Yes. Okay. Uh, and this is, we were trying to clean it. This, this was before the D2 years. <laughs> um, and then the other thing about this is that it's, um, it's searchable. So if I typed in Christy, because Christy can be spelled multiple ways. Well, I'll, yeah. Okay. So there you go. You, these are all the people with the names of Christie's. Um, and then you can, you can get to them that way as well. Uh, and the other thing about these maps, too, is that there's an information button and it tells you a little bit about um, the history of the cemetery. And then it tells you, I, I got this from some town information that there was more, there were more bodies there than uh, what you can see and that um, there are unmarked graves. We have we we did ground penetrating radar in here. Um, we found maybe a couple of instances where there might be people. Uh, what we did find is that over here where there are some stones, there are no people. So what, what it confirmed is that um, this is really close. If I, if I zoom in or out and come over here, this is the Arustic River. So this river, this cemetery has been flooded multiple times. So I think what happened is every time it flooded, when stones got moved around, somebody just put the stones back in kind of what they thought would be the right order. Um, so, And I think that people here, those graves probably weren't unmarked in the beginning. I think what happened is that the, ri that the river washed them away. Um, so that's, that's uh, this cemetery. Um, I mean, I can show you a couple more. This is the very old cemetery for uh, Fort Fairfield. These are, these are the original Irish settlers of Fort Fairfield. Um, and we've done some work on some of these, some research on some of these, the people in this cemetery. Um, and it works the same way. You can click on it. This guy, there's a guy back here that died in um, Salisbury Prison in North Carolina. Uh, hold on, let me get to his stone. Um, he's on the stone with his brother, I think. Hold on. Uh, yeah, here he is. He's back here. So uh, it says right on there, Nicholas Somers died in Salisbury Prison, North Carolina. Um, and, and again, you can see his stone. Um, this cemetery back in the 60s, the um, the Catholic Church, the church, there used to be a Catholic Church sitting right about here. Um, some people say it burned. Other people say they moved it to, and it became a farmer's um, outbuilding. I don't know. Anyway, the church moved into town. And in the 60s, the church wanted to tear down the cemetery. It was all grown up. You couldn't see the stones. Um uh, and and people, I don't think even knew the cemetery was there. But uh, this one man's relative, the, his name is Michael Russell, who actually was one of the very first settlers in Fort Fairfield, and he came across the border. I think he thought he was still in Canada. I mean, it was before the border was settled. Um, some of his relatives were were very. Uh, boisterous with the um with the catholic church and said you can't take down that cemetery and so they went through and cleaned it all up um which is why we can still see it today um and again there's information about the cemetery here if you clicked on that um so that's that's all i'm going to say about the cemetery maps at this point what i really want to show you is the story maps because i'm very proud of these story maps so we pick people from the cemeteries and we research their lives. Um, and what causes us to 
pick people is very random. So this is this is uh, we we found this stone of Lee Parker, and it just had his name and his birth date, his death date, and we realized that he was in his thirties when he died. And one of there was a little medallion that was um, on the top or by his stone. And we had never seen something like this before. And it said, this is part of, of the medallion, killed in the line of duty. So one of my research, one of my workers, um, she was interested in knowing more about him. And she went to the newspapers and started looking and found out that he was murdered um, by a poacher, um, in 1927. So I thought, well, this, this is going to be, a, this is going to be a great story. Um, so this is what a story map looks like. Um, these maps, this is, um, this is, uh, these dots are all, um, active. So if you click on them, You'll, you'll get more information about the geographical setting of what happened. This is where we think the murder took place was somewhere along this dirt road. Um, and Parker, the guy who killed him, um, some people said that he was framed and other people said that he wasn't. Um, so what was really quite exciting for me was I, we we have this special history program for adults um, who are coming back to school to get their history degree. And this this guy, Ryan John, he was in one of my classes and he was such a great writer that I said to him, do you want to do an independent study with me? And here are some topics I have. Well, it turns out that this guy is a published novelist from Macmillan Press. And he writes kind of like noirish uh, mystery type novels. And I can, I read his novel and I can see his character development and everything that he did for his novels, he did for this story map. And it's an excellent story map. And he, I did some research for him because this guy lives in Kentucky, okay? And I did some research for him up here. Uh, I got some stuff from Augusta, but he also found things that I hadn't even thought about because he was digging, you know, for more information about the different characters in the story. Um, and it's it's the way he wrote it, it. It was just it's an excellent story. So if you get a chance, I'm not going to say anything more about it, um, but you should go read it. Um, this story map. So I was in a different cemetery and there was a stone for this woman named Araminta Thomas. And her husband was buried right next to her and they died within a month of each other, maybe even less than a month of each other. And so, you know, we were kind of, hmm. but we were also, hmm, because we have a friend whose name is Araminta, who happens also to be an English professor and a writer. So, um, so Angela, who's one of my workers and one of my students, um, she and Araminta got together and they started doing uh, research on Araminta Thomas. Um, this is a story about postpartum depression and how they treated it in the late 1800s, which was really quite, um, well, it, let's just say we've come a long way in medicine. It's also a story about suicide. Um, she, she spends quite a bit of time in Augusta in the Mental Institute. Um, the do doctor's notes for her actually still existed uh, down at the archive. So that was quite interesting. Um, when she comes back, um, it's shortly after she comes back, she dies. Um, and they said that um, they, they, they wrote it off to um, uh, some common disease. Um, 
But about a week later, her father had her disinterred and had her stomach content sent to Augusta because he wanted to see if whether or not she was poisoned by arsenic. And that happens like that comes out in the newspaper. Like he probably did that like on a a Thursday or a Friday and the news about it came out like in the newspaper for, for like the like maybe the next Monday or so and the husband kills himself at the end of the week. So the question becomes did the husband kill her or did she actually die of whatever they said she died from um did he did he kill himself because in a certain span of time he lost his father he lost a daughter and he lost his wife was it depression um so i mean there's there's a lot of questions we can't answer um but again it's still a really interesting story about women and and just women's lives at the end of um, the 1800s and that's that's all I'm going to tell you <laughs> so you can you can sit read it and and again decide for yourself what you think about it um, the Malloy brothers um, are two Irish um, immigrants that came over during the potato famine and they do fairly well for themselves so this is a story map about um, the Malloy brothers. And let me just say, while I'm here, let me tell you a little bit about what story maps do. Um, they, you can link out to other websites. So if somebody doesn't know what the Webster Ashburton Treaty is, you can link out to that and read about that. Um, you can, um, you can put illustrations in here, illustrations on the side, um, you can we made this map to show where they came from um we if you go uh if you click like on the tithe records this will take you to um uh ireland records to show you their tithe their tithe records for the catholic church over in ireland um this is the catholic church in ireland that they went to um and where james was married um, this is his marriage record. So you can see we can add a lot of illustrations, but we can also add videos, um, YouTube videos into this. Um, so we can kind of make it a little bit more of an interactive um, interactive thing. Um, so again, you can you can kind of read about them and and their lives. Um, I think I don't know if the Malloy brothers were up when I did my presentation before. Uh, Benny Robinson is a black man who lived in Fort Fairfield at the turn of the 20th century, um, has a very interesting story, um, and, and you should, um, check him out as well. And then the rest of these are on the Micmacs. Um, this is something that a student did for a project in a class a while ago. So I, I included it in here cause it's pretty interesting, um, but I, I, my plan was to have these for teachers to use. Um, so I, I, um, I've, I've included them in here. Um, I, I, I have a feeling I have to do a little bit more um, work with the teachers to get them interested in working with it. So anyway, the, uh, that's just, you know, another place that I'm going. Um, there are some things, if you go to Fort Fairfield, for example, and you click on that, um, I, had a, I had a student who put the census records for 1850, 60, 70, 80 into Excel spreadsheets so that you could do, uh, you could run queries on them if you wanted to. Um, and so I had put them up on the website. Um, this is diaries from um, Charles Calvin Patty um, who was a prominent man in Fort Fairfield. Um, this is uh, letters that were actually bought at a uh, estate auction by Martha Grant. And um, they're uh, uh, 
author about the Richards family. A lot of them are letters that came back to them, but still you kind of get it. Some of the letters are um, from people who were in Fort Fairfield, just, you know, doing business transactions with them too. So you could look through that. Um, and then I did do a Colby and Rowe Atlas interactive map at one point. Um, and for this map, I overlaid um, this 1877 atlas onto a present day map so that you, know, that's, you can see that. And if you click on, um, if you click on the boxes, um, you'll see what, what the people had um, in the 1870 agricultural census. Um, and you'll also, you can also see what lot they bought um, based on, this is based off of um, one of the early, um, probably the, eight, uh, the 1830s, um, that Kobe and Roll Atlas is based off of an 1830s um, survey. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that um, because now, now you can go back and kind of explore everything. Keep in mind, it's still under construction. Um, the the second wave of money for this uh, was given to me um, just recently. So this is still under construction by the web, web developers. Um, so I guess I'll stop sharing my screen and see if anybody has any questions. Wow, um, that was great. I'm looking at the comments. There are two questions on the uh, in the chat. Both of them are mine. Uh, okay. One uh, is is whether the individual headstone data goes to Maine Old Cemetery Association or Find a Grave or other databases. Um, well, it hasn't gotten to the 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 um, what do I want to say? The Excel spreadsheets are just now getting finished. So because I didn't have very many to hand out, I hadn't started to look but or ask if anybody wanted them except for the churches or the people who are running the, the, the graveyards or the towns. So I will give it to anybody. I'll give those Excel spreadsheets to anybody who wants them wow. is, is the question is the answer to that question. And do I ever attempt to stand up stones that have fallen flat? No, because I don't, first of all, I don't know how to do it um, because I've not taken any of the um, classes that MOCA offers or the workshops that MOCA offers on how to do that. Um, second of all, they're too, they're too heavy without some kind of a pulley system. Um, if well, I did- Tied in with that, when you were talking about um, not taking a grave rubbing because the stone appeared to be so fragile, could not somebody support it from the back while somebody? Yeah, rubbed? I have had some people do that. Um, yeah, it just depends last, on the stone. Yeah. My last question is: I know you get your utensils from dollar stores usually, but where do you buy the D two or D five or whatever it is? Um, I buy it from Atlas Preservation. I'll put that right in here. Uh, you can find them on eBay. You can go to their website. Um, so, um, so let me just tell you, you can buy you can buy D two in a small spray bottle off of Amazon and pay and pay a lot of money for it. All right, and they'll send you what they call a grave cleaning kit, and it's just stuff that you can go to the dollar store and get for less money. All right. You can also buy, if you go to eBay, you can start buying the gallon bottles of it from different headstone companies. Um, and then there's a man up here who just started his own business. He's about ready to retire, but his business is uh, bringing up fallen stones, resetting them. And he, he went, I can't remember where he went. He went somewhere to do some special classes and it wasn't with the main old cemetery association. It was out of state. Um, so he knows what kind of stuff to use to create the seal again so that stone won't fall over and how to, how to straighten out the ground, flatten it out, put on the stones, all that stuff so he does that plus he'll also you know if you want flowers and don't want to take care of them um 
So anyway, he, he does all of that stuff. And he is the one that told me the best place to get it for the best price is Atlas Preservation and to buy it in five gallon bottles, which makes it roughly 50 bucks a gallon. If you go elsewhere, you're paying a lot more. And yeah, I know d mixing it with does work great and stretches it out. Um, it just depends on the stone. Um, I've had some pretty nasty stones that I didn't think we'd ever see again. But, you know, I spent, I probably spent, you know, quite a bit of money, you know, or D2 on it just because I wanted the stone to look. I, I like this. The other thing I'm doing is uh, is I've got some people writing more story maps, and one of them's writing about the art of cemetery stones and the symbology of cemetery stones. So if there were stones that I wanted her to use in that um, story map when she gets it put together, then I took the effort and cleaned that stone even more. Um, and so I used more D2. So, you know, we... We we kind of we kind of have this discussion about um, how much D two to use, and I'm I'm kind of like totally I've kind of started I'm probably in this project at least five grand out of my own pocket. Okay, let's just go right there. Between ordering records from the National Archives and buying D two. <laughs> Kim, there was a question. Someone asked, Fran asked, how do you identify the cemeteries you work in? Uh, how close they are to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I truthfully, um, I, I wanted to do something with central rustic history because for rustic history, it's the St. John Valley that gets all the press. And and not that they don't deserve it. They do deserve it. I won't deny that one bit. But I don't think people really know who the settlers were of this area. And it's kind of interesting because it's like three waves of settlement. It's the first the first group are uh, disbanded military soldiers coming across that were disbanded in St. John and come across into new, you know, further into New Brunswick and then hook up with woodsmen or some other people and then get into this area and, and basically um, become squatters. Michael Russell, which his story map will be up soon. He's a perfect example of that. There's a quite a few, there was a military settlement below Grand Falls up here. And a lot of those guys came across into what became Fort Fairfield. And I mean, Fort, Fort and Easton saw a lot of those guys. Um, so there's that wave of settlement. And when you've got that wave of settlement, there are some others coming up that are, are, English that are coming from like southern part of the state or from Massachusetts. So this time period I'm talking about is probably between 1800 and the um, the founding of the border in 1842. 1830 when we have the Aristic War in 1839 that brings a lot of men up here and some of those guys come back and stay which is kind of an interesting thing because at that point southern Maine is losing farm that there's not enough farmland for everybody right so there's men that are going west right because that's the beginning of really of westward that first phase of westward expansion for the U.S. some of those guys come up here and settle so that's a, another group of people who come up here. And then there's another group that comes back, that come across the border because of the Irish potato famine. So I think it's important to understand that we've got these multiple migrations coming into this area. It's not just the French up in the St. John Valley, but we have these other people that are coming up here to, um, to eke out an existence. Um, this Michael Russell, and, and I will get his story map up. It's just that the web designers haven't put it up for me yet. 
um, he truly, in 1830, he said he would not give any information whatsoever to the census taker from the United States. And I believe he did that because he did not want to be in the United States. He wanted to be in Canada. All right. He had been, he was disbanded from the Royal West India Rangers. And they were they were they were badasses. Okay. They were they were they were uh they were people who were taken off of prison ships off the coast of Ireland. And some of them had been deserters and some of them had been criminals. And Michael Russell was a deserter. Um, and then they send him down to West India to protect the uh, the slave owners down there because we have a whole series of slave revolts at that time. Um, and I believe that he thought that he was going to be in Canada no matter what. And, you know, the irony of it all is when they finally, finally drew that border, his land, that border ran right through his land. So part of his land was in Canada and part of his land was in the United States. And the state of Maine sent him a bill for the land, and they claimed that he was a squatter. <laughs> wow. He wouldn't pay the bill. His son became an American citizen, and his son paid the bill. So, we have I think another, it, yeah, sorry. We have another question on the chat. What kind of permission do you need to work in a cemetery? Um, I have uh, found the people who are the caretakers of the cemetery um, and I go and ask them. Now, that's all well and good if it's a big cemetery and there's a cemetery association, all right? So that evergreen, that 17 acre one, there's a cemetery association. The towns can tell you who take care of the cemeteries, but what I have found up here is that with the exception of the town of Easton that takes care of all of its cemeteries, uh, most of the other towns don't want much to do with their cemeteries. And there's a lot of small family cemeteries that are disappearing because the town won't take care of them. The families have died off or the families have moved. So, you know, they just go back into the forest. Uh, there's, you know, one where you can walk into the forest for a little way and there's three stones right there nothing more so uh, those those i don't get any permission i might get permission from the landowner but truthfully i think by by law you have access to cemeteries mm -hmm. um so um you know there's nobody to ask in the in that situation we uh, after they widened route 1a through dedham we discovered a cemetery it's a family cemetery it's the family of man with two ends and there's a Man Hill Road and a Man Hill in, in Holden. And um, that cemetery appeared to have been abandoned and then somebody put up a fence and no trespassing signs and it's been maintained ever since. But they lost a son a year for about six years in that cemetery. Uh, yeah. It may have been from the Civil War or it may have been from disease. Uh, the, the epitaphs don't say a whole lot, but it's an interesting cemetery to go to. And I'd just like to throw in one other comment. Several of my ancestor, uh, ancestors are buried in a cemetery in Eastern New Brunswick that uh, was kind of going back to nature because the people in the area took the headstones to to line their cellars when they dug their cellars. And so there, nobody actually knows what graves are there or where the graves are other than that it's a cemetery. Fort Fairfield, Fort Fairfield, I'm sorry, but Fort Fairfield is the worst town ever for its cemeteries, okay? <laughs> it could care less about its cemeteries. It, it had a cemetery, um, and the, that those Patty diaries, the Stephen Patty and all of them, it was it was the Patty Cemetery, but there were other people buried in there, and it was probably several acres. And in the seventies, the town just came and dug up all the stones and said, "This gets flooded. We don't really care. We'll take the stones." And somebody in that neighborhood took those stones, and you know what he did with them? He lined his cellar with them to give it extra support. So that's not an uncommon, I guess that's not an uncommon thing um, to happen. Yeah, but we're going to go do ground penetrating radar on that cemetery this fall, just to see how many bodies might actually have been there. Well, and there's another cemetery. Uh, there were several 
small cemetery scattered all over Bangor, which was one of the catalysts for the creation of the Mount Hope Cemetery. Yeah. And one of them is at the intersection of Buck Street and 7th Street. And they think they got all the graves out of it, but they're not sure. So there's a yeah. marker there that says this was a burial ground and there may still be bodies here and no one's permitted to build on that land now. Yeah, yeah. there's um, it, there's another cemetery in Fort. Um, and when the story goes, when they widened Route 1, uh, the road crew just grabbed the stones and threw them in the nearby swamp. Um, and there are Civil War veterans in that cemetery. And there's also a huge monument um, that a prominent citizen put up uh, in the late 1800s that says there are so many people in the cemetery that were descendants of the following men from the Mayflower. So we had Mayflower descendants in that cemetery. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'll, I'll shut up after this, but I, I will say the other thing that, um, and, and when you go back to the part where it has town stuff on my website, what we'll be doing this when the Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation gave me grant money, um, there was a farmer up here who's, who has an interesting story. I won't go into it, but they kept a lot of diaries and family photos and letters and everything. And so um, one of my workers has a, um, a certificate in archival science. And so we bought scanners and she's scanning all of that stuff. And we'll be putting that up online um, as well. So uh, I kind of give that as a shout out to to Kara, Kara, the, who's down here in my bottom corner, because someday Kara and I are going to get together and I'm going to scan her diaries as well. So, um, yeah. So. Well, this this has been really great. And you can tell from the comments how much people appreciate it. But um, what I'm interested in is how other people can learn from what you've done and this idea will spread. And what a great way to showcase Maine and New Brunswick history. I'm willing to work. I mean, I'm willing to work with people and, and you know, do one-on-one -on -one talks with people about, you know, how I went ahead and did this. I, I will say, I mean, the scope of this project wouldn't be where it was if I hadn't gotten grants. And I I, I got about $75,000 in, in grant or money that I got as a professor working at the university. Um, so, so I'll just be clear on that. And that money was to build websites, to pay people to write story maps. Um, to pay people to uh, to work for me in the summers, um, you know. So, so this, you know, it, I would say if you were going to start this, start at one small cemetery at a time. That's how can I would read, start. Uh, can you read that last comment because that's very the question important. Is, did you have to set up as a nonprofit in order to? No, apply? because I'm connected to Umpy. But oh. yes. You have to set up as a nonprofit to get. And one other question is: Would you object to putting either your email address or some other contact information in the chat? Uh, no, I don't mind that at all. Um, you can also get it off of my website, um, but I'll here I'll give it to you right now. Um, and it's. Uh, I mean, that first summer it was just me and one other person who was unemployed because of COVID. And so she, um, I don't know, we worked August, September, part of October. Well, that was a warm fall. So we worked actually till the end of October. And we got, we probably got like 12 little, little cemeteries done between us. Um, so that was kind of nice. But then, you know, I, I went for more grant, I, I went for grant money and, and and I probably will go for I, I probably will ask for another Maine Humanities Council grant to see if I can get that for next year. It'll be small. Um, Stephen and Tabitha King, you can do every two years. So I'll probably go back and have my hand out for them. And then by then, if I have all the cemeteries in this area done, I'm heading south. 
I'm going to do Southern or Rustic. I, I think it's a different story. I think there's a different history to Southern or Rustic than there is to Central or Rustic. And I want to know. And I want to know that through the cemeteries. Um, so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. But I'm I'm yeah. here if you want to ask questions, if you want me to give you any instructions or share any information with you. I'm here. I just don't pull stones back up and I don't I don't repair them. <laughs> but but this guy who's starting this business, he's going to help me uh preserve a small family cemetery that the stones are falling apart. There's a Civil War veteran in there and in probably a couple of weeks he he said that he would go and we could do that together so i'll see what he does i also believe that if you have veterans um in your cemetery uh, i think that you might be able to get some money from the um, veterans administration to restore some of those stones and um one day when I was in Evergreen, this car pulled up and it had on the side of it the gravestones of the Commonwealth. So I'm thinking, oh, somebody's here from Massachusetts, right? Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I No, it's the Commonwealth, as in Canada, England, all all of those, Ooh. that Commonwealth, you know, the Queen. <laughs> so the the Queen the queen gives money to this there's this organization this com this gravestones of the commonwealth and they 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 focus on world war one and world war two gravestones that have fallen apart and if somebody sends in a request and the grave needs to be replaced they will replace it um, because the queen has given them money and evidently the u.s government has also given them money so he was here checking on some requests for for stones that needed to be fixed and stuff. And there's there are Mainers that served in Canadian units because we were late yeah. getting into both wars. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. perhaps there's some of that money could apply in Maine. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. Some of that money can apply in Maine. And and if you want to know anything about that, I just email me and I will forward you that guy's email. Because he told me to go to the Veterans Affairs first, and if I didn't get anywhere with them, then to contact them. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to do that because that would be. I, I've got enough on my plate right yeah. now, but that's yeah. Something. Well, one of the great things about your project is that people who aren't in Aroostook County can still contribute, or people who are stuck at home, like your fellow from Kentucky and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can bring in a lot of talent mm -hmm. to do some of some of the project, mm -hmm. but it's getting late. So everybody's probably ready to end. But this has just been fabulous. And wait till I tell the people who I told you the Q&A is you, you can't miss it every time. So there was a lot in here that from this summer, like you said, that you couldn't talk about it. Maine Genealogical Society. So that was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. they'll be able to watch the recording. Yes. Well, like I said, if you have questions, I'm willing, I'm willing to share. I mean, I work for a public institution, so I'm not, right. you know, out to make any money. <laughs> I'm losing money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Thank you so much yes. for everything you do for yes. speaking to us tonight and yep. offering your future help. I really appreciate it. Yep. Yep. No problem. And it was nice to meet Kara. Finally, she and I have been, <laughs> we, we've been texting. <laughs> so awesome. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all very much. Good night, everyone. I hope I see you at the open house for the barracks on Saturday. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. Bye.